Thank you very much. There have been lots of good practical topics already today, so hopefully you will take some good things back to work next week. My few minutes will be slightly different. I'll do no more than give you a little insight as to how, as a patient, I've experienced my cancer journey. I was diagnosed with melanoma in August 2010. The primary tumour was aggressive, but relatively early and restricted to the skin. It was defined as stage two. Within just 15 months, I had lymph nodes removed, underwent radiotherapy, and with four tumours emerging in my torso, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma, terminal. With an aggressive melanoma cancer, my prognosis was grave, literally. But almost seven years later, as Elton John once said, I'm still standing. It has been some journey. I have very little insight regarding the technical nature of my treatment, per se. My experience is how I travelled along that journey, the directions I was pointed, and the paths I followed. And as a patient looking at you, this is where your role becomes really tough. I have no doubt that as health professionals, you know exactly what's going on with your patients, what their illness is, where it's come from, how to treat it, what it means to your patient, and where they are headed. Even in the developing areas, such as trials, where the textbooks simply haven't been written yet, you are across where the trial is aiming, what's happened, where it's come from, and more importantly, what is not yet known. But how do you pass that on to your patients? That, in my opinion, is the tough bit. First of all, in many cases, your patient has received some of the most stark and alarming news of their entire lives. The phrase, cancer is a word, not a sentence, has been used often to open our minds up to the medical advances that has seen quite a number of cancer patients survive very well. But the truth is, when a patient hears that word, cancer, so many minds gravitate to the glass half empty. So many people at this point switch off, providing detailed information regarding their cancer, providing their treatment, the next step is about as hard as it can get. Even the eternal optimists may not be in the right place. They often ignore the harsh realities of their situation. And this is where your role becomes quite awkward. How has your patient reacted? Are they listening or have they switched off? And if they are listening, are they thinking only of the worst or have they engaged? And if they are listening and you have passed on to them quite a bit of new information, how much did they absorb or understand? Should you keep saying more or should you now stop talking? There is no right or wrong approach is my guess and there could be as many patient approaches as there are patients. In my case, I tend to be a bit of a fact-based thinker. So when I was first diagnosed with melanoma, I was keen to understand exactly where I stood and what the next steps might be. My very first appointment with my oncologist, Dr. Peter, Dr. Peter, sorry, Dr. Philip, was just that. I asked questions, Philip answered them. And Philip's ability to simply explain where I was and what the future may look like was excellent. Nothing too technical, but he filled in gaps and he was open and frank. Unfortunately, the year that followed my first appointment with Dr. Philip brought to me all the new things I never ever wanted to see. That frantic year, I had appointments with four different surgeons, two radiologists, umpteen scans, numerous post-surgery clinics, largely based at Peter McCallum. And at the same time, I kept in very close touch with my oncologist. The information download along that 
journey was, to me, gold. The title of today's forum is Chemotherapy, Quality and Safety. Did my treatment meet the quality and safety criteria? Obviously, I'm in no position to judge on the technical aspects, but I always felt that I was in the loop and I did understand what was going on around me. As I went through the surgery and the radiotherapy during that year, my appointments were about the immediate. What the surgery was involved, why did my scalp have to be moved? What was radiotherapy all about? And what side effects were highly likely? And when the radiotherapy treatment started, I always had somebody over my shoulder making sure I was going okay. Every few days, I was in a session where a nurse would talk with me, walk me through how I was feeling, whether I was eating sufficient, whether the nausea was getting worse, anything I needed. But despite the removal of the tumour, two lymph nodectomies, and a month of radiotherapy, the melanoma kept on moving. By November 2011, I was at stage four. Philip had spoken to me about stage four previously, so the day I arrived, I knew exactly where I was. Philip had also given me a, a brief about a couple of trials that were targeted at melanoma. One controlling the genes, BRAF and MEC, and the other boosting a patient's immune system. Now I was at stage four, these trials were top of my mind. Here we go again, another information download, a new set of issues to get my mind around. Only on this occasion, there weren't any surgeons who knew exactly how to remove a bunch of lymph nodes. No radiotherapists who could describe exactly what the radio did and when it did it. Philip was now talking about brand new drugs. Drugs that at this stage, didn't even have names. It was known what they did and a fair idea about their side effects, but not a lot more. It was known that the BRAF and MEC inhibitors certainly were not a cure. The cancer, the melanoma, would eventually work its way around these drugs, but nobody knew how long that would take. It was just buying me some time. Under the BRAF and MEC inhibitor, Trials, I was treated through the Austin Hospital, having spent much of the previous year at Peter Mac. Once again, it was a matter of getting into the Austin processes, people, and learning all over again. During my time at the trial, regular checkups were perfect opportunities to talk to the oncologists and pick their brains as to what was happening across this trial. It wasn't long and there were over a thousand patients worldwide on this particular trial. Anything I could find out, I was happy to learn. For reasons that we simply didn't know at the time, my melanoma was actually still struggling its way around the BRAF and the MEC inhibitors. While most trial recipients were in partial remission for about one or two years, give or take, I was still in partial remission five years later. During that time, Philip kept me in the loop on what was developing in the immunotherapy world. Ipimumilab was out, getting some outstanding results in trials, both here and overseas. And in the immunotherapy development, following Ipimab were the anti-PD-1 anti drugs, back in the news earlier this week, strangely enough. In late 2016, things turned for the worst. A brain tumour emerged, and it was too close to a sensitive spot in my brain to be operated on. So the surgeon stepped back, and I was under the radiologists again. This time, though, the stereotactic radiosurgery was quite different to the radiotherapy that I had undergone previously. Like the BRAF and the MEC inhibitors, I was once again on brand new territory. Yet another steep learning curve. The radiation oncologist spent as much time with me as I needed to understand what this new stereotactic radiosurgery was, where it was aimed, and what side effects I might endure. And when all the dust had settled down from that radiology, it seemed to destroy the tumour. It was now time to move on into the immune therapy, another world of treatment 
to understand. The anti-PD-1 drugs had been enormously successful in their trials and in fact had been called revolutionary, not evolutionary, and were added to the PBS in late 2015. I've been taking the anti-PD-1 drug pembrolizumab, its brand name is Gertruda, once every three weeks since February 2017. In that time, I haven't presented a single sign of cancer. It goes without saying that the drugs that I have undergone over the last seven years have been amazing. But what was the work that treated them like? The information up there, updates that I've got across that entire time have been spot on for me. But that doesn't mean they'll be right for everyone. How patients are guided through their treatment is obviously critical. Conversations with patients need to be clear and concise. The information passed on can't be an overload, nor can it be too brief. No doubt, the balance should vary patient to patient. Quite simply, the manner in which patients react to, absorb and process their treatment is almost as broad and varied as there are patients. Conversations with patients need to be open, two-way. While the professional brings the detailed information, you may need to ask as many questions as you answer, as there are times when it doesn't matter what information you've passed on, the patient's mind is elsewhere. Many patients are at an absolute crossroads. Offer them a shoulder to cry on. If nothing else, it's just as important to listen as it is to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, you know, there's nothing more powerful than hearing people's experiences, and I think once again, having really captured for all of us the fundamental importance of communication and just thinking about some key messages that came from ASCO just in the last week around, you know, the real requirement for us as clinicians to think about our capability in the patient education and information domain. So, again, there was one question uh, that came through on the system and there may be more from the floor, but a question around your experience of the consent process. Um, and all the various stages you've just talked to and what would, that was like across the process for you? Yeah. Um, the consent process for me was absolutely uh, a no-brainer, uh, strangely enough, because uh, at the stage I had melanoma and terminal in uh, 2011, there were no options. Uh, surgery was the only one that was effective, and of course when you get it in your brain and places like that, they ain't an option. Uh, and when I got a tumour in my brain, the surgeons walked away in the other direction and just said, go and talk to the radiologists. So consent for me was effectively elementary, so relatively straightforward. I didn't have to swell on things, I didn't have to ask for second opinions. I could have and should have, probably more so, um, but I knew exactly where I was because I was well briefed along the way. Once again, I soak up those fact-based uh, uh, conversations very well because that's where my brain works. I'm an oddity in that sense because a lot of people don't. So it's really tough and that's why I said earlier, your role talking to patients is so hard because you've got the answers but how do you pass them on when they're not being listened to? It is a tough call. For me, I could have gone back to second uh, opinions and other uh, options about you know, what's an alternative. Um, for me, it was fairly clear cut. There were not too many options to bandy around and debate. So it was fairly straightforward, but for other people, I can see how that is so tough. But it's one of those delicate things, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.